Chapter 8 Dr. Getz, Getz pushed a wheelchair to Megan's room. For a lady, he said. I can walk, Dr. Getz, she said, pointing to the chair. Hospital policy. Sit. Don't you have orderlies who do this, she asked. You want an orderly to take out my best girl, Dr. Getz said, teasing her. I don't think so. He pushed her through the halls and into the elevator. Jim pulled the car around and Dr. Getz pushed Megan to the curb, opening the car door for her. He helped her out of the chair and held on to her, afraid she might fall on the melted snow on the pavement. I can walk on my own, Dr. Getz, she said. I know you can, he said, but I might fall. He smiled and helped her into the car. Then he did something he'd never done with any of his patients. He kissed her forehead. He closed the door, and Megan waved at him through the window. He felt a catch in his throat and put his he head down to avoid eye contact with anyone who might stop him to talk. Then he pushed the chair back into the hospital. I made it through my rounds, but it felt as if I were walking through a long tunnel of a dream that wouldn't end, but I was confident that I'd awaken and learn that the doctors had made a mistake. Megan wasn't sick after all. I can't remember how many times I told myself that when my mother was ill, but it should have been enough to learn by now that Megan was sick. In a little while, if she didn't get a transplant, she would get very sick. After my rounds, I made my way to the lounge and tried to open my locker. It was jammed. I jiggled the handle and pulled it toward me, but the locker wouldn't budge. In frustration, I tried several times. I leaned my head on the locker. This isn't happening again. I lifted the handle. Nothing. In anger, I beat my fist into the locker and pounded it over and over and over. Why did I meet her? I couldn't go through it again. I couldn't watch someone I love get weaker every day until death finally snatched her away. In one of her letters, my mother wrote, Life never has and never will be fair, Nathan. I won't be the first person you lose. There will be others. You'll stand by their side as, as they lie dying or beside their grave in a cemetery, and it's there that you'll have to make a decision. You can either lean into God or turn away. It will always be your choice, Nathan, not his. I closed my eyes. She never turned away. Even in death, my mother chose to go through the pain with God rather than without him. I didn't know if I could make that same decision. There are days when I can remember everything Megan and I did together over the next three weeks. Then there, were, then there are days when I can't remember anything at all. She would turn off all the lights in her family's living room, leaving only the lights on the tree to lighten up the room, and we'd sit there for hours and talk about everything or we'd watch the lights on the tree and say nothing at all. Sometimes we'd drive to the park and walk around the lake. Each time we were there, Megan would look for the runner she used to pace herself against, but we never saw her. It's the wrong time of day, she would say, disappointed. I hope I get a chance to see her again. Neither of us knew if she would. Her body was reminding us every day that time was short. One day our walk around the lake was slower than usual. I held firm to Megan's hand, afraid she would slip on the patches of ice on the path. She stopped beneath the giant oak tree and looked, looked out over the frozen water. She loved it there. She looked from side to side, taking it all in as if it were the first time she'd seen it. We stood in silence as she watched the runners making their way around the parameter of the lake, and I knew she'd give anything to be running with them. My mother wrote in her last letter to me, Dear Nathan, you have grown so fast. It was only yesterday your father and I brought you home from the hospital. As I watched you grow into the into the fine little man you are, I was reminded time and again that life is a mist. We're here for a while, 
And then we just fade away, leaving little bits of ourselves behind for the people we love. You'll be a man like your daddy before you know it. And I hope that when you're grown, that you won't let life slip by. I hope that for every loop and drop this roller coaster takes you on, that you'll keep hanging on for the rest of the ride. Just know that the ride is over before you know it. And if you close your eyes, you'll miss it. I didn't want to miss a second of the ride with Megan. Megan woke to sounds of her mother in the kitchen. She tiptoed through the living room and stuck her head around the corner. Allison was making every effort to be quiet, closing cabinets and removing bowls and pans with care. What are you doing, Mom? Megan asked. Allison jumped at her voice. Don't scare me, Megan. I'm getting too old. Did I wake you? No. What are you making? Peanut butter fudge. It was Luke's favorite. Her mother made it every year for Christmas, along with date balls for Jim, cookies by the dozen for Olivia and her class, and homemade candy that took an hour to beat to, for, to perfection for Megan. Megan ran back toward her room. I'm going to change and come help you. Allison stopped her. I can do it, Meg. Just lie on the couch and rest. Megan stopped in the hallway and turned back to her mother. For days, her mom and dad walked on eggshells around her. Megan was tired of it. Would you stop treating me like a baby, Mom? I wasn't. I was trying to treat you like normal. Allison wanted to treat her as she always did, but things were different now, and she no longer knew how to act or what to do. Well, you're not, Mom. If you were, you'd talk about what's happening. Allison stuck her head in the refrigerator. See, you're avoiding it right now. Allison pulled out a pound of butter, set it on the counter. Mom, look at me. Allison clutched the recipe box box and looked at Megan. A transplant might never become available. Tears pooled in Allison's eyes. Don't say that, Megan. Mom, you heard the doctors. I either get a transplant or... Tears fell down Allison's face as she cut Megan off. Please don't say that, Megan, she whispered. I can't think about... She couldn't finish. She picked up a dishcloth and buried her face in it. Mom, if I die, if I die, you can't be sad forever. Allison didn't respond. You're going to look out the window and life will still go on. That's just how it is. Allison wanted to say it was a whole lot more than that for the people who were left behind, but she remained quiet. Do you know what I want more than anything, Mom? Allison looked up. What? I want to help you make peanut butter fudge. Allison tried to laugh and handed Megan's, Megan a bowl. They spent the morning talking and laughing as one Christmas treat after another was prepared. When Megan lay down to rest after lunch, Allison cleaned up the mess in the kitchen, turning the TV news up to drown out the sound of her crying. Megan pulled a folder, folder containing information about the scholarship run out of her desk in the bedroom. She sat Jim and Allison down, going over every last detail from how she wanted the sponsorships organized to the day of the run itself. We're doing this awfully early, aren't we? Jim said. Isn't the race in June? Dad, it has to be organized so we'll know what else needs to be done. Besides my bank account, where else is all the money going once you collect it, Jim asked, hoping to make Megan laugh. She was all business. That's where I need help. Once the money goes into a trust, we're going to need a lawyer or somebody to help us make all this legal. Megan wrote, wrote the word lawyer on her legal pad and circled it. She'd have to find a lawyer she could trust. They finished the work an hour later, and Megan put everything back into her folder. I want Charlie to be the first recipient, she said. 
She looked at her mom and dad. It's important to me that somebody know that. I pulled into Megan's drive after my rounds one day and saw Charlie sitting on the swing set in the backyard. It was so cold. The snow crunched beneath me as I walked toward him. I zipped my z jacket and sat on the swing next to him. It's awfully cold out here, I said. I don't mind it, he said, watching his feet dig into the snow as he twisted the swing from side to side. I stuck my hands in my pockets. Did you visit with Megan? He, no he nodded. How was it? He shrugged his shoulders. Will they find a transplant? His voice was soft. I barely heard the question. As soon as a match is available, they'll get her to the hospital. But will they find one? I paused, looking out over the white yard. I don't know. He nodded and leaned further over the swing, staring at his feet. Why aren't more people or organ donors? I don't know. Afraid that if they actually say they are, that something will happen to them as if they're inviting death into their home? That's stupid, he said. People are dying every day because they need a kidney or liver or a new heart. He stopped swaying back and forth and looked at me. She says there are always miracles at Christmas. Do you believe that? My heart sank. I didn't want to answer him, but I knew there was no way around it. Charlie was too smart for double talk. If we can't believe that miracles happen, then we may as well stop believing anything at all. He looked down at the ground, ground again. Do you love her? he asked. He waited for me to answer. Man to man? I asked. Man to man. Yes. Then you better tell her soon because I love her too. And if you don't tell her, I will. I smiled. Charlie was a rare gem. I reached over and squeezed the back of his neck, praying that miracle Megan believed in would happen.